ransomware hits NASCAR, and new variants of Cryptex, Mirkop, Cerber, Locky, and Bard are reported. Some are describing the current wave as a global epidemic. Point-of-sale malware and checkout skimmers continue to bother the retail and hospitality sectors. Brexit watchers foresee a surge in Berlin's startup ecosystem. Intel is rumored to be exploring the sale of its security unit. Observers think the DNC was hacked by Russian intelligence, and speculation moves on to wonder what the Russians want to do with the U.S. election. More DNC documents are expected soon via WikiLeaks. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, E8 Security, and remind you to visit e8security.com slash DHR to check out their free white paper, Detect, Hunt, Respond. It's going to give you the information you need to deal with the unknown threats in your network, the threats no one has ever seen before. E8 is going beyond legacy signature matching and human watch standing, and they're hunting for these unknown threats with machine learning and big data analytics. See what E8 has to say? Download the free white paper at e8security.com slash DHR. We want to thank E8 for sponsoring the CyberWire. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Monday, June 27th, 2016. Most of the hacking news to emerge over the weekend involves developments in ransomware. Circle Sport Levine Family Racing, which races on the NASCAR circuit, revealed that in April they were hit with TeslaCrypt. The attack would have interfered with the number 95 car's competition in the Duck Commander 500, and so the company paid the $500 ransom to restore their files. Malwarebytes has since helped remediate the attack, and we now see the big M for Malwarebytes on the hood of number 95. Sentinel-1 reports seeing a new Cryptex variant. The malicious code, as revised, now defeats the free decryption tools that had worked against earlier versions. Avanon this morning released details on a Cerber email phishing campaign that has been discovered targeting Office 365 users. Microsoft began blocking malicious traffic last Thursday, and as always, users should look to their backups and keep their patching up to date. Trend Micro notes some oddly self-righteous behavior from Mirkop. The ransomware comes with a Guy Fox mask bedizened screen, and it accuses victims of having stolen from what Trend Micro primly calls a notorious hacktivist group. The ransom demand is a very steep 48.48 Bitcoin. This is almost $29,000 at current rates, comparable to the higher end of the healthcare ransomware demand seen earlier this year. Mirkop gives the victim a Bitcoin address and tells them to pay up. That's it. The extortionists assume you're familiar with Bitcoin transactions, and they don't bother with the more detailed payment instructions most ransomware masters use. It goes without saying that the victims haven't, in fact, stolen anything from the hacktivist group without a name. But the accusation seems intended to make the threat scarier, although whether it proves scary enough to induce people to cough up $29,000 remains to be seen. Perhaps the hacktivists over at Anonymous will look into this appropriation of the Guy Fox mask. We've seen the return of the Necor's botnet back from this month's temporary pause. App River reports having seen Locky being distributed by the bots and speculates that Necor's masters are preparing for a large-scale criminal campaign. Fishme warns of a new Locky sibling out and active in the wild. BART, as they're calling it, uses the same downloader as Locky, Rockloader, but unlike Locky, doesn't depend on command and control for encryption or payment. Instead, it stores files in password-protected zip files, and it uses a victim identifier and a Tor connection to facilitate payment. Its ransom demands are also higher than Locky's, typically 3 Bitcoin, about $2,000. Fishme does have some mitigation tools available. Kaspersky looks at these incidents and others and calls a global ransomware epidemic. We imagine that would be a pandemic. In any case, ransomware appears to be working, which is why it will continue to draw cyberspace's Willie Suttons. That's where the money is. As always, take precautions by backing up your data and avoiding reuse of passwords. We heard from the Johns Hopkins University's Joe Kerrigan about good password practices. We'll hear from him after the break. The prevalence of ransomware shouldn't induce us to forget the persistence of other forms of cybercrime. Point-of-sale attacks continue, and one self-checkout vendor, Ingenico, offers a helpful side-by-side comparison of real self-checkout card readers with bogus skimmers. Krebs on Security has the photos up on his website, but the short take is this. 
The criminal's skimmers are wider than the real terminals. They have to be in order to accommodate the skimmer with the plastic overlay. Panda Labs says it's found about 200 terminals infected with the punky POS. The malware is known to have been in the wild since the spring of 2015, and it underwent an upgrade in April of this year. Most of the affected systems are in U.S. restaurants and bars. Other non-ransomware vulnerabilities and exploits are also being reported. Ben-Gurion University of the Negev Cybersecurity Research Center and Telecom Innovation Laboratories in Berlin report that a flaw in Widevine EME CDM enables viewers to bypass protections on content streamed through Chrome. Other researchers are discussing some obfuscated JavaScript malware, a Facebook comment tagging scam, being distributed through Chrome. And the scary-sounding Android exploit Godless now strikes many observers as less dangerous than initially thought. Users in India, however, ought to be on their guard. The malware seems endemic there. In industry news, as analysts and investors continue to think through the implications of last week's Brexit vote, there's little consensus as of yet. But a number of people think Europe's tech startup center of gravity is likely to move to Berlin over the next couple of years. Intel is rumored to be in talks with bankers to arrange the sale of its security unit. Intel security was formerly known as McAfee, and it's retained that name for some of its offerings. Last week's talks about revisions to the Vossener Cyber Arms Control Agreement are reported to have developed in a more industry-friendly direction. Industry skepticism about the very possibility of controlling software exports remain, however, and we'll be following developments closely. Finally, at this point, few people are buying Guccifer 2.0's claims to be a disinterested hacktivist who doesn't much like Russians. The emerging consensus is that the DNC hack was indeed the work of Russian intelligence services, despite a flat Kremlin denial of involvement that goes beyond the non-denial denial issued by Russia's embassy in Washington last week. SecureWorks says that Fancy Bear, that is probably the GRU, has also been prospecting military spouses, looking for leads on U.S. military deployments and operations. It's also been looking into journalists critical of Russia and activists of unspecified but presumably unfriendly interests. Much speculation circulates that President Putin wishes to influence U.S. elections. Did we mention that this is speculation? It's speculation. More stolen documents are expected soon via WikiLeaks, so stay tuned. This CyberWire podcast is made possible by the generous support of Silence, offering revolutionary cybersecurity products and services that proactively prevent rather than reactively detect the execution of advanced persistent threats and malware. Learn more at Silance.com. Joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Joe, we've seen in many of these uh, recent uh, large-scale, high-profile hacking cases where where gobs of passwords have been released out into the public that uh, people are still reusing their passwords across uh, multiple services. Uh, This is a bad idea for a lot of reasons. Right. A lot of times people reuse passwords for the sake of convenience, and they might even use the same passwords on all the sites they access. Uh, It's a profoundly bad idea because (laughs) even if your provider gets breached, which, which happens all over the place, we see that happen every day, we hear about it all the time, or even if your password is salted and hashed, uh, and they, you're using a, a password that can be guessed or eventually is guessed, if you're using that on all your sites, per, for example, your email site, where that information may have also been leaked, well, the, guess what? Now your email account is also compromised. And yet people continue to do this. And I think uh, the reason is, is that it's it's easy, it's convenient, and strong passwords can be hard to remember. Absolutely. Strong, pa- strong passwords are hard to remember. Uh, and as I've said before on this, on this uh, podcast and to many other people, I use a password manager to help me do that. I remember one very long password, and I don't remember any other ones. Uh, and all of my passwords to access any of these sites are all different random 20 character passwords. And, but I think it's that extra step that gets in the way. It, for it is the extra step. And even, even as I'm sitting here advocating for this, I'm telling you this and I'm thinking to myself, every time I need to log into one of my accounts, I, ugh, I sigh and I go, there's a part of me that says, 
I have to enter that password. I'm going to mistype it at least twice. I know <laughs> right. it's going to take some time. But then, then there's another pass side of me that goes, hey, shut up. You need, you need to do this because this is what makes your password secure and keeps, your, keeps all the money from disappearing from your bank accounts. Yeah, no, it's important stuff. All right, Joe Kerrigan, once again, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And that's the CyberWire. If you enjoy our daily look at cybersecurity news, we hope you'll help spread the word and tell your friends about our show. Our editor is John Petrick, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.